It's my first time in Australia. I Ooh. arrived two days ago. It's fantastic. It feels like Vancouver to me. Have people said that before? Really diverse and similar kind of climate, and everyone's been so welcoming. Um, so thank you for inviting me, Kyle. And um, I know Gerard Gogan from the International Communication Association. A number of Canadian scholars come regularly. Um, and I'm lucky enough to be the president right now, so um, they asked me to come down and share some thoughts at the big conference, and I'm really happy that you were asking me today to talk about my collaborative work. So I, I think I'm the strangest ICA president to date because my work has not, first of all, I never sort of was driven to become the president of the International Communication Association. My work has always come from my gut. Um, in my background in human rights and women's rights and international work at the UN um, with, uh, that, that started years back. My friend is in the back, Joyce uh, Brandful. And uh, how many years ago? 30 years ago, we met at the United Nations doing human rights work. And so um, that's really driven my, my academic work. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the roots of my work today and um, how I survive in the academy and getting research funding and thinking about ethical problems in, in research that comes with community. And I'm going to share some of the key scholars that I refer to and, and derive my strength from, who are feminist scholars and postcolonial scholars. And then I'll get into some of the nitty gritty of, of the work that, that I've done, focusing on especially two projects with refugee youth and with um, kids with major depression, and how I collaborate with them, sort of thinking about these ethical questions. So, They've got me speaking for a long time, so if you need to sort of get up and walk around the room, I won't be insulted. If you need more food, just get up and move around. Um, so I'm at the McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. It's just outside of Toronto. And um, I moved from the Ontario College of Art and Design University a couple years ago to take this chair. And it's a downtown university in Toronto that focuses on art and design education, which has really, really started doing this, this kind of work. Um, and as having a background in human rights and NGO work at the United Nations, work in, in rape crisis, um, I came to the academy really as an activist move. I, I wanted to make documentary film, and, and I have made documentary film, but when I moved to the Art and Design University in Canada, opportunities availed themselves for lots of research funding. So Canada is a pretty rich environment for grants that the grant success rates can range from 20% to up to 50%, which is a really strong rate compared to the United States, which is my other home country, um, where the grant rates are much lower. I don't know what the grant environment is here. Is there a sort of a good structure of federal grants that you can apply to for research? Yeah, I Yeah, the decent? Yeah, because in the United States, it's very difficult to get humanities and social science funding. But in Canada, you really can. But, but it comes with a bind, right? And that bind is that increasingly people that win the grants are working in community or they're working with industry, right? So <coughs> mostly they want you to co-create knowledge and to disseminate knowledge out into the community. And if industry is involved, even better, right? But that brings with it a number of um, challenges. <coughs> so here's some of the granting bodies that I've been lucky enough to get money from. and. Um, so uh, I'm going to read a bit, and I'm going to talk a bit as, as I give this talk. So um, one, of the, one of the things that uh, worries me is that some of these grants come with obligations, as I said, to work with, with uh, community and with industry. And so we risk compromising our research integrity and building a neoliberal-type service university that can uh, forget the core role of the university, which is to teach contextual knowledge, history, critical thinking, lateral analysis, to train students to be thinkers and to be problem solvers, and that's something humanities is really great at. Um, but you know, I think that uh, this is a reconcilable position if you can do things, and I like to, to say if you can hack the grant. So if you can work the grant so that your ethical principles arise to the top, and so that you're working with people in community and even small and medium-sized industries who can share your commitments. And I've had good luck working with small and medium-sized industries because they're often creative industry people who are artists who are just making a living and you know are not trying to sort of reach to create an international global industry whose own uh, sole motivation is profit making, but is really interested in. Uh, innovation and creating media products, for example, that can help 
grow communities. Um, so I have applied for these grants, and I have come to think very, very carefully about what it means to have an ethical approach. So a few things that I've realized need to be do done are the following. So first, half the grant. Um, if the grant it requires you to bring in a certain amount of matching money, for example, instead of asking IBM to give you $100,000 and then uh, you are responsible to, to create deliverables that IBM wants, you can work with small and medium-sized industries, or you can work with community groups and ask for an in-kind contribution, which means they're just putting some time into your grant, right? So I want a lot of grants, almost all of my grants, by getting in-kind contributions. Um, you need to meld methods and process, and this is a real problem in the humanities people are working with people who come from engineering and science backgrounds that are very disciplinary based, because the modes, the methods can be very different. So coming from engineering or science, a lot of researchers are single disciplinary, they're not interdisciplinary, and they cannot work transdisciplinarily, if I can say that word. Um, they often have very firm dates for deliverables, and it, uh, they work with sequential design, so everybody does their own piece, and then at the end, you know what you're trying to create. In a humanities-based process, very often we're using arts-based arts methods, right, that are about um, uh, breaking processes to see what happens, um, creating new methods to try them out, and the process is really the goal of the research as opposed to you know, knowing what you're going to make at the end. And so merging those methods and processes is hard, and in order to do that, you really need to uh, meet with people ahead of time and figure out if you can work with them. And so I kind of have a list of things that I need in a partner um, if they're coming to the table. And one is that they are sort of radically experimental. They're not going to remain committed to a disciplinary approach that they're comfortable with. They have to leave their ego at the door, which means they're coming to the table to bring something, but to learn as well. And that's really the most important thing, right? Radical brainstorming, they need to be able to sit and listen and not say, oh no, that won't work because, right? That's the end of brainstorming <laughs> if somebody does that. You have to say yes and, yes and, yes and. So those are some of the things. Coming from an art design university, we try to play in the lab when we're making something, and that means actually using play-based strategies, because play is a way to solve problems, right, in a really creative, experimental way. And then we, we have really radical ethical guidelines. <clears throat> and I'm gonna talk you through what, what some of those are in a minute. Um, but first I'll just introduce these four projects that I'm gonna be talking about. So one, one project, it, it was to create um, an app with depressed teens to migrate a form of psychotherapy that they were using onto a mobile phone. And the challenge was, how can this phone um, be exploited? How can we exploit the affordances of this phone to um, add new ways of doing therapy for the kids outside of the clinic? So rather than just have the phone replicate the therapy that happens in the clinic, how can we exploit the affordances so that they're taking this, this phone on the road? How can we use a critical and cultural studies approach so that we're um, using devices they like in ways that they like in sort of youth scenarios that make sense to them? Um, the next project that, and this is just kind of a heads up, and I'm going to talk about this later. The next project is the hypermigration project, and this is a project um, that we made with refugee youth in Toronto, and that was sort of a radical co-design project where we brought them an idea and then they broke it and we made something entirely different, which was actually the plan. Third project is a project with Baycrest Hospital, which is a big hospital in Toronto for seniors with varying forms of dementia. And um, we were bringing to them um, a gesture-based project um, in order to test the question of whether or not arts-based practice and games-based practice that engage them using their bodies, right, in front of like a, a connect, could help with their affect, help with mood. And so we were co-creating with people with dementia. And then Effect, which is my current project, where we're trying to solve the very wicked problem of why women and women identifying people are dropping like flies out of ICTM environments. The rate in North America right now is about 23% of employees in internet communication and technology fields are women, and the number continues to drop. A lot of people have asked the question of what's wrong, and Anne Balsamo is a, 
a North American scholar who says, you know, the problem is, um, you know, the approach has been add women and stir. Like, if you just add more women to the environment, then we're going to fix the problem. But the stirring is the problem of the part, and I'll, I'll talk about that. Okay. So a few key issues um, that need to be addressed when we're talking about ethics um, and collaborating with people in the community. And when I'm talking about community today, I'm really talking about um, community groups and um, especially at-risk youth, the depressed youth, the refugee youth. And I'm not thinking so much about working with people in SMEs, the industry people, because that's sort of a, a, another different situation. The problem with working with people at risk is that there's a real power disparity, right? Um, so a couple of things. Um, a lot of collaborators who are participants are in precarious positions, um, it, meaning that you know their housing, their educational um, access uh, is, is very diminished compared to the access that I have in the university. Um, they have limited access to um, a good high school experience, which would, is going to limit their access to a university experience, limit um, access to upward mobility. Um, they are accustomed to, to habits of being disempowered and being grateful if someone offers them an opportunity, so that's an immediate power disparity. They're accustomed to a top-down model of pedagogy and a top-down model of delivery, and they're often ignored or silenced when they're sitting at a table or in a classroom. And so co-design is a solution to these, to these power disparities, but it requires a few things. So one thing it, it requires is fully informed consent. And research ethics applications are just the beginning of, of meeting your ethical obligations to participants. Fully informed consent means that the participants understand what the right risks might be of working with you at the moment, and what the risks might be later of putting an opinion um, on a video that then goes onto the internet, it might become viral or replicated. It might um, make, their, make them uh, not anonymous any longer to immigration officials, for example. Um, talking about a mental health condition in a group might make them feel insecure. It might re-trigger them um, and remind them of a traumatic experience. So these are all really important things. But consent has to go on throughout the project. So when I work with at-risk, uh, any at-risk people, community members, I always offer them the opportunity that they can leave the project at any time. So I will lose my data right up until the end, until the very end. I don't really set a point that they can, they lose consent. And I think this is really important for establishing, establishing trust. Um, we try to level power and uh, understand how different kinds of privileges are occupied by, by researchers as opposed to people coming into the university for the first time. We give something back um, in order that this kind of work that they're working on, the project, is sustainable for them. So we, we share skills, we give them design seminars in return for their participation. Um, we reframe the idea that we are the purveyors of knowledge, the researchers are, right? So we frame the idea of what epistemology is. And we create a shared community ethic that we're trying to build something together because we all believe that the end goals are going to be important. So there are certain kinds of strains that come when you put together people from the university, from industry, and from non-governmental or community groups, right, that are structural problems. So I was talking about sort of soft power problems, but there are structural problems. So one is that uh, industry and NGO calendars are different from the university calendar, especially in North America. So we'll take summer for research, and our graduate students will sort of go and work on their theses. And so we have these two or three month lags. Um, our uh, clocks for writing contracts are, are all university clocks for writing contracts. Graduate students um, get sick. Graduate students have family obligations. Graduate students graduate and leave your teams, right? So turnover happens throughout the grant. These are big problems, so that's a staffing problem. Um, the other problem is what I was talking about earlier, which is a methodological problem. So a lot of times if you're working with industry or even community groups, they need to know what the deliverable is so that they can send it to their board. And when you're working at an art-based art, arts -based approach, very often you're just trying to consider and accumulate problems and understandings of problems, right? 
so that you can reevaluate or reframe a problem. So these are very different goals, and, and this creates a lot of problems. The, the, one of the biggest problems we experience is that arts-based and humanities-based research is really durational, right? You need time to consider, time to reflect. And the last panel was sort of talking about that too, right? Like how do you build time for reflection into these very busy schedules that we have? And working with industry and NGOs, there's a very different sense of time. It's not durational, it's time limited. So these are very real problems and they, they create strain for the academics who take the grants. They turn you into a project manager instead of a researcher. Enormous problems. So, I want to step back um, for a bit and talk a little bit about how I draw on feminist and post-colonial scholars to make theory actionable. A lot of theory is often not actionable. I remember from my PhD days being so excited by the work of Michelle Foucault and using it in my PhD dissertation. And the greatest complaint was, you know, so so what do we do? How do you, you know, um, power is productive, right? Great. How do you produce power in action? And everyone's like, I don't know. Ask ACTA, right? The AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. They did it, but Foucault didn't show them how to do it. The, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power figured out how to make Foucault actionable. So here's some work that might or might not be actionable. Some of it is, but we've tried to make it actionable. And I'm sure a lot of these theorists are going to be familiar to some of you in the room. So Gaia Tristana. I'll just read a little bit. Um, many decades back confronted white liberals with the problem of speaking for and representing individuals she termed the subaltern, meaning visualized, racialized, and ethnic minorities and women those who are seen as others and who we sometimes stand in for and speak for. The speaking for others is often done in a do-gooder fashion by people who want to help, but in the process they disavow voice, silence voices, and in turn disavow the knowledges held by subaltern individuals. Spivak reminds us it is not a normal activity, but a symptom of privilege. And as a solution, she insists, we much, must let the subalterns speak from their experience by bringing in their material and corporeal experiences that we can then interrogate and analyze via theory. And I'll sort of add all these up at the end. Um, Sarah Ahmed is a, a British scholar, and um, she writes uh, such informative work. So one of the things, and I'll quote from her, um, she says is, Norms, or how bodies worked and are worked upon, shape the surface of bodies. So norms impose um, surfaces on bodies. Regulative norms function in a way such as repetitive strain injuries, through repeating some gestures and not others, or through being oriented in some directions and not others, bodies become contorted. They get twisted into shapes that enable some action only insofar as they restrict capacity for other actions. So Sarah Ahmed is suggesting that those of us who don't suffer from norms of compliance will be complicit in this burdening if we don't actively counter it. Right? So if we don't act, know when our participant collaborators are wearing norms that suggest they should be quiet and not add their voices, for example. So this is Amber Dean, and she just published this book um, this year in Canada about missing and indigenous women. We have an epidemic of missing and indigenous um, murdered uh, women in Canada that has been really poorly um, interrogated and investigated nationally and by police forces. So she interrogates how media forgets about the thousands of missing and murdered indigenous women and causes on all of us to pause to consider who becomes grievable, who is grievable in the grand narrative of the Canadian multicultural experience, and who is not. Dean points out the obligations of those of us who sit in centered positions due to colonial legacies of gender, race, and ethnicity. Our obligations or our inheritances, um, inheriting a colonial position, in other words, creates the obligation uh, to take responsibility for inheritances 
and for burdens that um, we cannot ignore, so to, to actually make those bodies grievable, right, and to call for those sorts of investigations. Kim Crenshaw um, is a feminist and law professor who's American, and she brought the idea of intersectionality that some of you might be using into the academy, an approach it that analyzes how power operates across myriad forces, gender, race, class, sexuality, age, ability. In, 19, in 2015, however, she wrote an article for the Wall Street Journal imploring us to use intersectionality in community action. She says intersectionality can achieve a few things. It can show the invisibility of constituents within groups, groups that claim them as members but fail to represent them. She's thinking here especially of black girls. And to show the multiple avenues through which racial and gender oppression are experienced so we can all better discuss the problems and understand them. And she's thinking about community-based work, bringing this idea into community action. So she's pointing to the work of Black Lives Matters in North America, and in this image, Black Girls Matter, um, that make intersectionality actionable. But she's also shown that intersectionality can shine light on all kinds of exclusions. It's a tool for all kinds of folks, trans people, queer people, indigenous people, to frame circumstances and fight for visibility and inclusion. So this is really important because as you know, a lot of times in the academy, theory is not made actionable. Sheila Sandoval, um, Methodology of the Press. So Methodology of the Oppressed, in, in this book, she's calling up Donna Haraway's um, understanding of the cyborg and noting that it sits on the back of third world feminist analysis. Um, and she solves the actionable problem directly in this book. She recalls that we have great ways of analyzing in the academy, especially in communication and critical theory, right? We have data collection and analysis approaches. We have critical analysis, epistemological engagements. But she calls on us to take a fifth step, which is to make an action plan at the end of these critiques that we all engage in to show how our study can be used to create social change. So these are some of my uh, key, in, key uh, informants right, for my work. And I've just discovered um, Leanne Simpson this year when I was at the, um, the Women's Studies Association in Montreal. So Leanne, uh, that Tassa Mosake Simpson is indigenous Nishnabe from the Ontario area of Canada. She's a, a, a writer, she's a poet, and she's a theorist. Um, and she has written this really wonderful paper where she's talking about how to draw on Nishnabe philosophy to think about how land is method, land is pedagogy. Land is a way of life and a way of knowledge uh, creation. Um, so this is in great contrast, this Nishnabeg approach to you know, our Western, linear, modernist, epistemological ways of thinking. They are very often top-down, have a linear delivery of knowledge, expert to student, teacher to student, um, hierarchical, judgmental, right, grading, um, linear, time-driven, um, and call upon knowledge that is often disembodied and dematerialized. And so she counters and says, well, Nishnabe uh, epistemology uh, in encourages everyone to theorize. Learning is self-motivated. It's an embodied practice. Um, she tells a story of her little girl going into the woods and discovering um, maple juice leaking out of a maple tree, not knowing what maple syrup is, but kind of seeing a, a bird lick the maple juice. And then she did it herself. And she went back and told her family, like, look what I've discovered. So they all came out. And she explained it to them, and they went home and boiled it up and made maple syrup and cooked the evening meal in the syrup. And she said this is very common because um, you're responsible for your own learning and for sharing the learning and then dialoguing on the learning so that you can create your epistemology and present it. And you know, knowledge is then include multiple ways of thinking and multiple epistemologies in this, um, in this Nishnabeg approach. Um, so it's, it's a radical epistemology, right? Teaching is always contextualized. You never say, this is the truth, this is my truth. Intelligence comes from consensual engagement, right? Not coercion. It arises in fluid exchange and the development of knowledge in family and community. It inculcates diplomacy and it produces diverse 
knowledge is. So these are all really important, um, these bring really important ethics for us to think about. And some of the things we therefore think about as key ethical dilemmas in our work is power is often blind in how it operates, it's hidden. And we've, we've got these references in critical theory in Frankfurt School, right? Um, knowledge is rarely requested of participant collaborators. Usually we want to um, have them test something that we've made. Theory is often not turned into action. Dialogue and co-created knowledge is possible if we change the rules of the game and base them on the team discovery in a, in a place where we really share our own power and everyone's bringing knowledge to the table. How am I doing on time?
in order to uh, light a fire, right? To sort of get ideas floating. If you if you went to this group of youth with depression and said, what do you think we should put on the app from your therapy? They would just look at you because they're not designers. It would take you nowhere. So we prototype ideas and put them in front of them simply to start the conversation. And then we invite them to completely rip it up. And this, is, this has been a really, really functional technique with them. You know, the other problem is if you're co-designing um, and people aren't professionally employed as co-designers and they have other jobs and other lives, you can't ask them to be creating in every stage. You can't ask them to come up with a concept, to uh, learn to draw designs, to think about user interaction design. You can't ask them to do all of that. You have to do some of that for them and then let them engage in uh, reflecting on the experience. So, so we did that with them. So we made, we made a couple of presentations and they absolutely were you know, failures. So one of the things was they were taught guided meditations um, by the therapist, and there were two stories that, that we thought would be really good as MP3s. One was called Demons on the Boat, and the other was called Leaves in the Stream, right? So the Demons on the Boat story is, you know, you're trying to drive this boat to the island, and you, you want to get there, but the demon keeps taking the steering wheel, right? So what do you do? You know, you got to tell the demon, like, yeah, sit next to me here, right? And then you do your diffusion, and you um, your mindfulness, training and then you're able to steer the boat, right? We thought, oh, the students are going to love this, right? Demons and boats. No, they hated that story. They liked this story where they yeah, sat by the stream, they imagined, they watched a leaf at the top of the stream, and then their job was to watch it move down from the water, across various rocks, over roots. They love it. Right, teenagers love this. So we had this wrong entirely. So we had to recreate the story so that we did leaves on the stream instead of people's on the road. Just a simple example. The other thing that we wanted to do was to create a diffusion technique, and this is um, what we came up with. So diffusion is a, a, pra a practice where they take thoughts that are reoccurring that are unuseful. And I'm choosing my words really carefully here because you can't use words in mindfulness like invasive thoughts or unwanted thoughts because it creates judgment around those thoughts, right? So you say things like, I'm having thoughts, right? They're really thoughts you don't want to have. And so in order to get rid of these thoughts, one of the techniques is to take the gravity out of them. So if you're a teenager and your thoughts are, I'm fat, ugly, no one likes me, why am I scared all the time? And these things are going in the loop. One of the techniques is to say it in a very silly voice that the voice is really loud or something, right? So you can hear the ridiculousness of this self-judgment, right? And we thought, well, how, how are we going to do that? And so we thought, well, maybe Mad Libs. Do you guys have Mad Libs here? Okay. So Mad Libs are, for those of you who don't know, it's a game that we played when we were at lessons. And it's a, it's a story. It's, a, it's like a one-page story with a lot of blanks in it. So it would say like, one day I went to the blank and I ran into blank and they said it, it was blank out blank, right? So you fill it in and it makes a ridiculous story. So we thought, oh, teenagers love this. We're gonna make a Mad Lib. And we brought, brought it to them. They hated it, they hate Mad Libs now. I don't know why, <laughs> it's like the social media era. <laughs> they don't like Mad Libs anymore. So, but, you know, I was working with young students and they're like, what else are we gonna do? And um, Somebody had introduced to me the, the rap app um, at OCAD I was in a, a faculty meeting. And uh, a rap app is you, you tell a story or say something into your phone on the rap app. Then you hit play and it plays it back to you in a rap beat, right? Like, I'm really ugly and I'm really fat and this is, you know, like, so, so we were like, well, maybe they'll like this because they like the rap, they love the rap app, right? So, you know, we prototyped this with them, they said, great, great, and then they wrote one, they all read it together, the rap app, we had this group rap app that took the gravity out of, you know, hating yourself because you're a depressed teen. Totally worked. <laughs> so, anyway, here, here are some of the ways that we co designed with these students. Um, at the end, we wanted them to have a reward, a takeaway of the app. Um, and so instead of, again, you know, there's, there's a current rap app, or there's a current act app uh, online, but it's really, there's some judgmental pieces in it. And one of them is, did I achieve my goals, right? Yes or no? And so again, not very mindful to say, oh, I, 
fail, you know, and then you could see the negative thoughts coming into the, to the human head. So we said, well, you know what we're going to do is we're going to let you track your values through a pull down menu, and then you'll sort of get uh, colorized uh, accumulations when you use the value, and it builds this kind of um, animated figure um, with colors. So you can see what you've been working on. Right? So it's all very sort of positively reinforcing, and uh, the creature evolves and grows, and the idea is that you can kind of save it as a, a screensaver that you take. Anyway, this was really uh, amazingly successful. These students, we expected to have, you know, sort of lose participants over the weeks. We have 100% uh, participation over a period of many months in building this app. And, and I think, again, it was because they felt like they were designing the app, or at least they were driving um, what was produced in the end. So funding, we uh, we want to commercialize this as a, a, a non-profit a kind of, you know, industry, so that we can just hire someone to choose the app available online. And so we've been searching for funding, and we haven't found it yet, actually. Um, but that is an app proven its, its prototype. So that was that was a really rewarding um, project for us. So hypermigration. Hypermigration is a project with refugees in Toronto. Um, I've been working on a documentary film um, for 12 years on the asylum process in the United States of America and um, the condition of survivors of torture and persecution who come in as asylum seekers. And the short story is they come in, um, almost all of them lose their case, especially if they're in certain parts of Florida. Uh, while they're there, they are availed of no resources allowing them to stay, and they're left with everything behind them. It's a terrible, terrible situation, and most people in the world think America would be a great place to go to if you're an asylum seeker, and it, it is not because of that reason. So I had all of this leftover footage, and I thought, database so that people could sort of pull up stories and we could add context so that people understand why people fled Sierra Leone in the 1990s, for example. What was going on there? What are the levels of stress, civil war, but also sort of, you know, gender-based problems, economic insecurity, environmental stressors, and how do those layer on and create all of these reasons for these migration exoduses that we're seeing? Um, so, but as I thought about that, I thought, you know, we have a population here in Toronto. I wonder what they would like to do. Maybe they would like to tell their own stories. And so I started um, doing some research, and I found this group, um, this, this refugee center in Toronto. And in this case, it was cold called them. So in the last case, they found me at the university, the psychotherapist. But I just cold called them. And I explained my long history of human rights work and my ethical commitments and this co-design project, and they were about to. So you never know, right? They wrote back to me and they said, come and talk to us. So we went over to the refugee center and they have a youth group there. And the youth group was meeting and um, and they invited us and they were having a, a dialogue on like their, their dreams, like what, what would they hope they would achieve in Toronto. And they were really wonderful um, and creative. They were from Central America, um, the Horn of Africa, and um, mostly those places, and, and one, I think, from the Middle East. And so we explained the, the project to them, and it was only because we explained to them that they were going to drive the project and how we were sort of leveling power and their knowledge was as important to ours. They said, well, that sounds really good. That sounds like access. They were very, very precarious. A lot of these youth were probably undocumented. We never asked them because we wanted to protect them entirely. Um, and, and so we started working with them on this project. And, you know, I, again, I thought, well, to start the conversation, we're going to present this idea to them. And, you know, they can break it if they want. And so we said to them, oh, yeah, I was thinking if we mapped your stories and added all these layers of context of why you left and your effective labor and et cetera, um, that, you know, you could tell your story. And they said, why would we want to tell our stories, right? And I thought, you know, so we were relying on, on trauma theory, um, which suggests that um, 
Do you have a trauma and experience that Kathy Carruth and, and Judith Herman and other trauma theorists describe as deworlding? So something happens to you that doesn't make sense in the world that you live in, and so you have a hard time making sense of it. So one of the therapies is telling a story about it and trying to put it into some kind of coherence so that you can just live with it. And they said, yeah, no, we don't want to do that. And, and so we started um, working with them, and uh, as we worked with them, we realized that what they really wanted to do was help newcomer youth to Toronto because they lived such precarious life. Um, and so we, we started using um, a game deck and augmenting a game deck that comes from Mary Flanagan. So Mary Flanagan is a um, academic and designer in London, and um, she's got a, a game deck that's called Grow a Game, and it's available online. You can get the, the Grow a Game game. And what it does is it gives you sets of cards that have verbs and nouns and issues and a game design strategy. And you shuffle these out, and this challenge is to take a social issue or to add your own social issue, characters, locations, places, and, and create a game around it. And by creating the game, you engage in problem solving, right? It's really effective. It's great in classrooms. It's great in design teams. So we started playing with this game um, with them. And as, you know, again, we created these prototypes for how they would play the game. So the, our first shot was, well, tell your stories of survival in Toronto. And we'd shuffle them some cards. Well, this was not fun, as you might imagine, right? So they would say, well, you know, I, we, we escaped, you know, over the border because there's still not a wall there yet from Mexico. Um, and, and then we came through and we traveled precariously and now my parents don't have a lot of work. I'm out of high school. I'm not eligible to go to university because I'm not a Canadian citizen. Um, and, 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 you know, we, were, we all just sort of sat there and sort of stopped the room. And I thought, well, this is not a game anyone wants to play. This is not a game. This is like therapy in a group. And, and the youth are going to hate this. And, but one of the things we noticed was that they were talking about, as they told their story, they started talking about solutions. And they, they started moving the cards around, grabbing each other's cards to show different places they went as a result and people who helped them. But the other thing they did was they layered affect, their affective experience on top of that. So I felt dismayed. I felt hopeless. I felt so depressed. I had anxiety and panic attacks. They kept layering these um, emotional experiences on top of this. So from that, we came up with an entirely, well, a similar game, but a game that they wanted to play. And the, the game was this, that the, the strategy, uh, the objective is to create a solution to the problem reported by this refugee youth. And in doing that, they wanted to play this in groups with newcomer youth to help them with different problems. So one of the problems is, there, a lot of them are undocumented. And so when they're walking down the street to go to school or to, to go to the, a job, if they have one, and they see a police officer, they have to be prepared um, with what they're going to do. Because if the police officer, if they do anything that looks amiss, the police officer can stop them. Then they can ask them for identification. And the minute you show that you are undocumented, then you go to the detention center. Right? And I have to say that this doesn't happen a lot in Toronto, but it absolutely doesn't happen. It's not the tendency under the Justin Trudeau administration. It very much was the tendency under the Stephen Harper administration, but it's not anymore. But it could happen. So suppose they look like they were up to mischief. So they all have a plan for how to walk by police officers. But you know what they do? They don't walk by them. They walk right up to them. Hello, sir. How are you? Great day. And they shake their hands. <laughs> Right? So they don't look like they're at all at risk. And it totally, and they all did this. So this is the kind of sort of secret strategy that they had um, that they wanted to tell through the gameplay. Anyway, here's the prototype for the game. We thought that um, we would make customizable decks, even decks that they could color in themselves so that it becomes their, you can add to the deck. But the other thing that this does is it gets them, um, it, it helps them to grow their literacy 
around effective experience, right? So especially if English is their new second language, they're learning words like, you know, I don't just feel bad, like, oh, that's called anxiety, right? That's called hopelessness, right? That's called inspiration, right? So, so this was really important to them. This was their idea. So they loved this game. By the end of this project, we were just sort of sitting back and they were redesigning the game and creating different iterations with the deck. So this was hugely successful. And again, you know, go back to, you know, the solution I think was, this was achievable I think because um, of these ethical commitments. I don't want to talk too much longer because I've been talking for a long time and we're going to have a Q&A. Um, but if you want to talk about this, this is a gesture-based project um, where we um, were taught by the seniors that they didn't want to make um, sort of pretty um, move, move leaves on the screen with their hands to meditate. They wanted a strategy so that they could beat each other in games, right? So all of our ideas about, about these seniors with dementia, right? That, that they, they just wanted to relax and call up long-term memory. Oh no, they wanted to keep learning. They were not afraid of the technology. They were ready to play with gesture. They were 90 years old, right? They had nothing left to lose. They totally uh, threw up all of our expectations into the air. And so that, that was such a pleasurable experience. And, and we're, we're, we've got another grant to work with another population now of fragile seniors at McMaster. And I'll just say this is my, my latest grant. This is one of the most challenging uh, collaborations ever. And this is an answer to the um, ICT problem. Why can't you just add women and stir? And I was just finished, we just finished up a grant. Oh, my picture is missing, the FemLab grant. And we worked for a year and a half trying to figure out why that approach doesn't work. And there's a lot of reasons um, that make basically these uh, environments feel very inhospitable to women. Um, there's very often a sense of insecurity if you're working late at night in an editing studio, you're the only woman, you're leaving late at night. There's a lot of uh, after-hour unpaid work that you have to do to train yourself. So you're trying to put your kids to bed at when you should be at this training seminar. There's a lot of what we call proto culture, right? There's a lot of jokes that are gender-based where girls feel very uncomfortable and women, and that happens a lot in these IT spaces. A lot of times women say something at the table and uh, people don't hear them, and then a man at the table will say it, and everyone will say, Joe, what a brilliant idea from Joe. Right? So these are these are problems that have been reported over and over again. So our our my grant, when I wrote this grant, my question was, well, what are we gonna do about this? How do you change the culture of educational environments and ICTs so that we're really addressing some of these new problems? And the answer is ethics, right? How do you change and bring to light our ethical commitments to not using power and bias in these ways? How can you see it when it's when it's there? But sort of invisibilized, right? So how do we do this? How do we work together and not just blame each other and get defensive? Because that's not the answer either. So I put together a group of academics, community-based, here they all are, here's some of them. Academics from five universities across Canada, uh, feminist entrepreneurs, anti-violence groups, because a lot of content produced by ICT and media organizations, of violence, especially gender-based violence, um, and then some community-based educational groups like Lady, Ladies Learning Code. Do you know Ladies Learning Code here? So this is a community-based group that teaches girls to code, right? Bring those skill sets in. And our work has been to work together to, to educate around what all of those different groups know about how work happens in these environments and how gender and race and other kinds of discrimination plays out. Um, again, we're using these feminist principles, um, especially kind of finding ways to call out the issue when it happens at the table. So this is one of the things that happens, right? Like somebody comes up with an idea and somebody else gets credited for it. What do you do? How do you not sound like a victim, right? How do you raise the conversation without making somebody sound? Defensive, so calling out by one of the techniques that we were taught in, by the anti-oppression group, Metrac, is the pause, right? So how can we say, let's just stop for a minute, so something just happened, and you know, how can we correct that, right? And try to make it a group solution-based process. Um, so anyway, we're going to start this project. Um, we have named our different groups according to feminist networking strategies, 
right? So that they power and the pods that network together. So it's not like I'm in charge as the PI and I tell everyone what to do, but there are sort of these um, self producing and self managing groups and we all work together. It's really hard. It takes a lot of conversation. It takes extra labor out of my time and out of everyone who is engaging in those conversations. Um, and that's where we are now. Um, we're coming up with a couple of things. One is our manifesto on ethics and ethical practices in the workplace. Um, and we're, we're trying to come up with an, uh, an ethical platform for a feminist ethically engaged platform that can be useful for managers, for educators, etc. So um, that would be the last term that will be good for the release will be up on, on the website, um, I don't know, in, in a year or something. <laughs> so uh, anyway, just to just sort of summarize, and I really want to summarize quickly. Um, <coughs> the feminist and anti-colonial, post-colonial work, I think that especially the work that I pointed to, it's all grounded in rethinking the assumptions of our practices, right? And this is a very critical theory approach. Um, and so for me, it, because we use those practices in our research, it, it becomes easy to make them actionable, right? Because they are ethically based choices that we make all the time when we're sitting in the team as to who gets to contribute, who gets to talk, who didn't just get to talk and get overlooked. And so you can, you can create a method that levels power. And you can also just in your everyday life, right, be the one that's responsible for saying, you know what, I'm going to take this step back. You can more than evaluate, right, you can sort of make those choices. And so for me, you know, after 13 years of doing this, I really think increasingly um, this is, this, the success of these projects are really based in sort of ethical evaluation and this ethical, well, this ethical formulation that you use to create your process. So I will leave it at that. I'm sorry I talked so long. It's hard to listen for an hour. But thank you. I'm happy to have some conversations and to hear about the work that you're doing here as well. And we're using it for dance improvisation too. 
And we've added in some biometric devices, right? So you put in input and you get this real-time return. Um, and it's a really, it's a, it's a really cool experiment in the Do you do work on games? Uh, not a lot. Just, well, I enjoy a lot of board games and things like that. Yeah. It's like a normal experience for me to sit around with some friends and, and talk about stuff as we come back. But didn't conceive that that could be, like you say, a methodology to yeah. talk through these issues of power as well. You know, there's a, um, a scholar named Joe Dumit at uh, UC Davis, and he just gave a paper that I saw in Toronto around, and, and he comes out of science and technology studies, not gaming. But he's been using gaming to teach his students about fracking and the problems of fracking. And they've been trying to brainstorm how to resolve fracking problems. But in order to do that, they had to build a game that created all of the dynamics that allow fracking to create the problems that fracking creates. And he said that it, it was the best way to teach problem solving for a very particular you know, scientific problem. And of course, they love it, right? Because when you play, sort of give yourself permission to think laterally, right? It's just enjoy, <laughs> enjoy hard thinking. It's very effective. Yeah. I don't really have a question. Actually, I would like to talk to you later. Yeah. I had an idea during the hackathon for uh, a game that would help prevent violent extremism. And it was a yeah, I'd like to talk to you about how you put those grants together for the game. Sure. I'd probably be able to go with it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is there are federal grants that you can apply for here? Yeah. I guess or there are some, yeah. 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 Um, it's a tricky one because the games don't, when you pitch it as a game, it doesn't always get the support or is taken as something kind of, you know, as problem solving as connected. Yeah. You know, as, as a real world. Yeah, yeah. There are academic references in game studies now that sort of prove it as a method that has outcomes. So, you know, they love outcomes and grant applications. You know, it's really an objective and outcome. Quantifiable. Thank you. Yeah, I 
I, uh, I guess I always think of it as an experience that involves art and aesthetics and creativity. And very often, you can just call that play. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a question. Uh, I, I'm really interested. I, I really enjoyed your presentation. And I'm really interested in um, the way you're sort of drawing on um, the opportunity for, for people to engage you know, in creative play um, in order to, I don't know, get the best outcome and also to have a positive outcome at the end. Um, I just wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the uh, ethical, um, your concept of sort of using ethics as a way of managing the power um, challenges. Yeah, so I, I guess, um, I guess I've been in a lot of research networks where you use users, right? So you know, when we call it user testing or user interaction design. And so you, know, you get all of the thinkers together who know stuff, right? And then you, you make something and then you put it in front of the users and you say, okay, you know, guinea pigs, play with this and we'll see if you can do it. And maybe we'll see if you like it. And the more I was brought into these networks, the more I realized that if I was sitting in that chair, I would feel really disrespected. Right? The other thing is, and you know, I always say this to industry too. If you if you ask people what they want, they, they will tell you. You don't need to create stuff on your own and throw it in front of them. Like it's really a problem we have with being the experts. We have this thought like, well, we, we got all of this theory, and I have all of this experience. Let me bring it to you, refugee you, right? And the, I don't know. I think having a, a human rights and a, a sort of a mental health background too, like you're taught to dialogue. So if you dialogue with people and say, well, you know, tell me where you come from and what you use in your everyday life, and what was your experience of using this thing that I just brought to you, they will tell you. And they'll tell you how to fix it, especially the seniors with dementia. <laughs> they'll tell you everything you're doing wrong and what you should be doing instead. So, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. I'm so happy to listen to your sharing about uh, how to develop a project project apps. Because uh, me and my friends also, uh, we are developing um, an app for children with autism. Oh, yeah. uh, it's an AAC or um, Alternative Assistive Communication. Uh, it's simple, they can create picture cards with text and sounds to communicate with other people. But uh, since it's a collaborative project, we collaborate with uh, other people to develop the apps. Right. And also the people from psychological department yeah. and spatial education. Um, and I'm quite new in this project, so I'm a bit confused how uh, academician and communication background like me yeah. would contribute to this project, this kind of project. Yeah. Maybe you could give some examples. Well, you know, almost every network I've been in has asked the question, how do communication scholars work with engineers and scientists? And I don't think we've ever answered it well. Um, I. I love working at Art Design University because the art students know how to code, right? And then you sort of skip the engineer and you go right to the art student who makes, writes creative code. And when you say, we don't really know where we're going, but this is the first hurdle, they say, got it, right? And when I've said that with engineers, they said, well, what do you want to build at the end, right? So having that conversation around what is your process for development, right? And so is it sequential? Or is it iterative? Because if it's iterative, you make one full experience, and then you test it, and then you go back and you do it all over again, right? So that's sort of an arts humanities-based approach. But a lot of designers use this now. So if you ask them if you use iter iterative or sequential, that will help. Um, and then you, know, you have to ask about their end goals. So if they have a very firm end goal, and you're imagining more of a process-based project, you're going to have a problem. You're going to have to reconcile that at the beginning around how you're going to deal with, you know, what if you change your mind halfway through and you've decided this really shouldn't, 
well, in making an autism app. Um, you know, it should focus more on affective attention as opposed to cognitive development, right? What if that's what you're finding is really needed? Is that okay with everybody? If you change paths, start again, maybe you'll have to write them another grant to finish it. Is, is it okay if you have sort of that important failure? Um, and if they can't, then you have to think about if you're just gonna go in their direction or if you're gonna drop that. <laughs> That, yeah, the conversations, you know, and conversations over coffee and over food and over beer, if you drink beer, or, you know, like out at the university where people are relaxed, like some of my best work happens in those spaces, right? Where people are just sort of like, okay, I'm taking off the hat now. What do you really want to do? 